Okay. So um, we've been talking about all kinds of really deep internals and uh, I'm going to bounce us way, way up stack for a little while and then Brian will lead us back down into the kernel with uh, the stuff he's going to talk about. Um, what, I, what I do at Circonus is um, I automate things. So I build packages, I develop deployment procedures, I make sure that uh, all of the code changes that we're constantly pushing out um, can be deployed. Um, and I have a system in the background. I don't know if that makes me a dev up. Um, I don't really like to hug strangers, so maybe I can't be a dev up. Um, I don't know. It's nebulous. It's a distributed architecture, service oriented, so small functional components, single function, everything's decoupled, asynchronous. Um, and it's available primarily as a public SaaS, uh, but we also discovered that there's also a market for people to operate it privately. Um, it runs on OmniOS and RHEL, and really only RHEL because we have to, not because we really want to. So we grudgingly support that extra platform. But I'm not really here to talk about what Sarconis does in so much as I'm here to talk about generically how we deliver what we deliver um, using OMS technologies. Um, so our, our goals are fairly simple uh, at a high level. We want to bring up all of our components um, across an arbitrary number of systems. So some of the deployments will put a single function on each zone or physical system, and others will be more compact for whatever reason, uh, the, the machine footprint needs to be smaller. Um, we wanna be able to deliver a consistent set of software regardless of when somebody chooses to update. So, uh, because we're constantly pushing package updates, and we wanna make sure that people get um, something that's been tested to work together. So, our drug of choice uh, on the OS, uh, and I'm biased because I helped create it, um, but it, it really is the right tool for the job, and it, one of the reasons that we created OmniOS at OmniTI was um, for deployments like this. It's a traditional deployment. We're often just using the global zone. We, we can run in zones. Uh, it doesn't really matter to us, but uh, this was, this was the, the way that we wanted to approach the problem. The, uh, the reasons that we really like on the OS, obviously there's the, the Illumo stuff that I think most of us are familiar with, so I won't belabor those too much. Um, the image packaging system is something that I'm gonna touch on uh, pretty, spend most of my time on. Um, and that's not technically part of Illumos. It was developed uh, at Sun along with Open Solaris. It was for Open Solaris. It's been taken uh, into Oracle Solaris and we also have that legacy in Illumos. Um, it is not the only packaging system that's available, but it is one that we've found easy to use and uh, as I'll explain, actually uh, has some unique features that enable us to do what we do. Um, zones, Crossbow, if you're not familiar with that, that is a, a, a nickname, I think, I think it was the internal project name at Sun for a suite of um, network virtualization technologies. So things like VNIX, uh, the things that Robert was talking about earlier. Um, that's building on top of the, the things that came out of Crossbow. And of course, you know, ZFS and SMF and all the, the goodies. So just briefly, um, this is the generic um, way that Circonus gets deployed, either um, in the public SaaS version that we run um, or a private on-prem solution. So we have a, a single OS package that delivers a Chef Solo environment. Um, you provide your local config in the form of a Chef data bag, which is just a JSON document. And then you run our management script, which reads that config, figures out what roles the local machine is supposed to have, and just does a Chef run and converges the machine to a state where it can uh, be a participant with all the other nodes. Um, and thereafter, when you want to update it, you just run the same script again. You just keep running it whenever you want on whatever schedule to pull in any updates that are available. Uh, and this is, this is the herding cats part, because um, we subscribe to a, um, a philosophy that, that OmniOS also espouses, because it all came out of the same organization, that we call keep your shit to yourself, right? So um, the, the packages, the software that's critical to operating our platform, we want to own the release schedule for that. We want to build it ourselves the way we want it. We want to put everything in a consistent place, and we want to be able to control when that gets updated because we, we don't want to get screwed by dependencies um, all the time. 
uh, for things that we can't uh, that we can't control. So we have a bunch of software that we that's that's ours, and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's just open source dependencies. We have Perl modules, we got C libraries, and all kinds of stuff, databases. Um, and we need a way to contain all of those things, our stuff and all the third party dependencies and constrain it all in some sort of meaningful fashion. Um, so the way that we do that is that we use the image packaging system. And forgive me, I'm gonna have to digress a little bit to explain some of the features of it um, so that you'll understand why we do what we do. Um, this is a little bit of information about it. It's uh, developed at Sun, as I mentioned. It's a network-centric packaging system. So um, unlike things on Linux, like where you have Debian packages that have network, there's a separate tool to, to network distribute those packages, which are really just file archives. Um, this was conceived with the idea of having network as a uh, major primary feature of the packaging system. So everything is baked in, network support, network retrieval. Um, it has its good and bad points, obviously. There's, there's, um, there's, no, uh, there's no perfect solution to this problem. But it does, it does let us have very efficient updates. So when, when you have a new version of a package and only a few files have changed, you only have to get the, the differences. Um, it integrates really well with ZFS and SMF. So um, a lot of times when you update a package and it's going to change the state of the system, it will take a ZFS snapshot automatically. So you'll have a way to roll back if, if something goes wrong. Um, and you can also actuate SMF services from the packaging system itself. So when a file changes, you can have a, a service restart or you can have a new service imported into the system when a package is installed. And um, the dependency support is really rich and that's the, the main thing that I, that I wanted to talk about. So the format of a package name, um, it takes the form of a fault managed resource identifier and this is a concept that came out of Solaris. This is, uh, covers a lot more than just packaging. Um, services and hardware are also part of this um, fault management architecture. So there's a scheme that is the PKG scheme that we use to describe packages. And they have various components. Um, I won't belabor the point too much, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. You have a publisher, which is just an entity that publishes packages. It's a way to kind of namespace the packages, so if people choose the same name for a package, you can distinguish between them. Um, the, the name component is um, up until the at sign. It's arbitrarily deep, and you can choose whatever sort of uh, naming hierarchy that makes sense to you. So for us, um, we use field for anything that's like a third-party dependency that's going to be deployed um, on out in, the, out in the field, basically. So this, this package is the concurrency kit library. Um, the component version is the upstream version of whatever the software is. And then there's some um, system specific versions. There's a build version, which is the build of the OS that it's for. And then a branch version, which is kind of a customized place that um, distributors can use for their own devices. And then on OmniOS, this is the, the release of OmniOS that the package was built for. And then a timestamp so that if you need to re-roll the package, uh, fix metadata, whatever, um, you can distinguish between two roles of the same upstream version. And um, by the way, that's a, that's a pretty gnarly looking format, but it's extremely easy to machine parse. And that's the whole point of versioning because you're, you're telling the machine to figure out the versions and people don't really need to worry about it too much. Um, so a package in IPS is really just a, a manifest and some assets. It's like a, a, a bill of materials for the, the package. And it, everything, one of the things that I happen to like about IPS is that it's extremely complete in that uh, metadata completely describes the package. It tells all, all the information you want to know about it, the name, um, strings that describe what it is, what it does, and then all of the, the different assets delivered by the package. Dan, you had a question? Um, actually, an interesting piece of trivia to go along with that. Or correct me if I'm wrong, you, in a sense, uh, ship things with Debian packaging, but you use the IPS manifest to generate for the Debian package, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I should say that um, in, in Illumos gate right now, um, when you build the system, uh, it generates 
uh, these manifests. It generates IPS manifests. And because they are 100% complete in describing the, the way that we expect those assets to be packaged, they can be translated into other packaging systems. So if you really don't like IPS, or you want to use something else, you can, um, you can just look at this information and it tells you everything about how the package is supposed to look. So it's you can definitely. It's incredibly parsable and very useful. I've, yeah. uh, I've built this two times. Mm -hmm. uh, once I did it in corn shell, <laughs> and, uh, and I built an, I used to build an ISO a day. Yeah. That's how, that was how our product was built. At, uh, so for a Lumos 4, this is it. I have at least this code in where I'm building the image builder in Go, but it, so I have a Go library that deals with IPS mm -hmm. manifests. Yeah, they're, they're very well structured. Um, it's very uh, straightforward and pretty easy to understand even if you haven't read any of the documentation about what all these things mean. But it's, it's pretty clear that you know, when you consume things in the system, the actually, when, when you publish a package, you, you give it a manifest and then you, you hand it all the files that you want to be part of the package. Um, and all of this stuff gets programmatically generated. There are tools um, that are part of the system that allow you to programmatically generate this a manifest like this from a prototype area. So you've installed all your files somewhere and then you just run over all of them. And then you can programmatically transform those manifests to change file ownership or permissions or whatever you want. So you don't actually have to mock up a proto root that's exactly like how you want it deployed. You can just put the files in the right directory structure and then programmatically transform your manifest to either slice and dice it and carve it up into multiple packages or you know, change any of the aspects of how you want things packaged. So in that respect, it's uh, very easy to automate. And that's another reason that, that I like it is because it's, it's easy to plug this into a build system that constantly builds and updates packages. So, um, but the, the core concept here is that on the, the very first um, item in each line is called an action. And it's pretty clear that like a dir action delivers a directory and a file delivers a file. But the, the dependency actions are what I'm going to focus on for a little bit. The depend actions are um, all the, the standard ones that we're familiar with from any other packaging system. The require will cause the dependent package to be installed. Um, optional and exclude um, are pretty pretty straightforward. But then when you put um, you can you can have an arbitrary set of the version, um, anything to the right hand side of the at can also be part of the dependency and that constricts what the dependency means so that uh, when I require something, uh, I can establish a minimum version of a package that, that I want to depend on uh, to some degree of specificity from left to right. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, but the, the other dependency type that's kind of unique to IPS, I haven't seen anything like this in other packaging systems, but if you know of one, please let me know. Um, it's called the incorporate dependency, and it, it is a, it's an optional dependency, so if you incorporate on something and it's not installed, it won't be installed. But if you install it later, it has to fit within the version constraint expressed by the incorporate dependency. So this allows you to establish both a floor and a ceiling uh, to establish a, a, a range of acceptable versions that can satisfy this dependency. And what that allows us to do um, is actually to create a package that does nothing but create incorporate dependencies. And in, in Solaris par parlance, this is called an incorporation. Um, so we have this package called the Circumference Incorporation, and this is the master authoritative source for a known good working set of software that implements Circonus. Um, so the manifest will, is, it's much longer because we have over 200 packages, um, but each line expresses a dependency on a version of a package. And uh, what we'll do when we, when we have this management script that's running and doing this, this chef run, this package gets installed really early in the process and so that all subsequent packages that are installed for whatever role or set of roles that you're part of um, are all constrained within this file. Uh, and and it's, it keeps everything in one place. So um, it, it, instead of distributing among all of the packages that we ship this knowledge of who depends on what and what versions are required, it's all contained in one place. Um, and so then once you have that installed and you've got a whole running deployment of Circonus, updating that package will pull 
any, any changes um, will be pulled up as part of updating the incorporation package. And anything new that you install, of course, will also have to fit within that constraint. Um, and that, like I said, it allows us to, to really concentrate all of the knowledge about what our good set of packages is into one place. Looks like I'm running a little short, so we'll leave plenty of time for questions. Um, beyond packaging, uh, the other things that, that we love about Illumos are the things that I think most of you are familiar with. So, you know, being able to run in zones, being able to um, logically have multiple roles, which don't necessarily conflict with each other, they can run in the same zone, but for management reasons, it's nice to sometimes split those apart so that you can treat them separately. Um, as long as the signals get delivered. As long as the signals get delivered, yes. Dan's referring to a bug we had. Um, where if you were communicating between zones on the same host and you, you were using a particular type of socket, uh, where you need a particular needed, socket type of I.O. basically. Where you need to be signaled yeah. to, to go read from the socket. Um, and that, that traffic would, of course, because we're on the same physical system, wouldn't actually go out onto the wire and come back. It takes the short path and it would basically we would not realize that we're going between zones and we would never signal the the traffic so the the, the receiver would never see that there was anything coming in uh, and then the, the traffic would die and that was pretty painful to to diagnose and i think it's been fixed since the beginning yeah that's pretty yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's i think that was there since yeah and the way the way that we found it was that we're running we're running the, um, the Circonus metric collections agent, or the broker, in a non-global zone, monitoring NTPD, which is running in the global zone, and getting alerts that NTPD was not responding, and you go look and it's, it's fine, it's, it's totally good, but why can't the broker talk to it? Well, that's, that's how we eventually figured that out. Um, SMF is just a fantastic service framework. Um, it's a true framework for service control. It has all the right primitives in it. Um, it, ha it gives you the ability to detect when any service on the system is not in its intended state. And that's such a valuable thing. And it's, it's so cheap and easy to do that, that we just do it as a standard monitor now. We, we, we deploy it on, on every system. We constantly watch for services that are not in their correct state. Um, and the fact that it's integrated with the packaging system so that when we d deploy a new version of the package, it can tell the service to restart automatically and you don't have to do a wacky shell script to restart the service and you can actually be pretty intelligent about that. Um, ZFS, of course, because we care about our data. We don't want to lose it. Um, and the way that we can carve out chunks of the ZFS uh, data set hierarchy and delegate them into non-global zones. And so that a non-global zone can create new data sets, create, set the mount points on them, change properties, do whatever they want. Um, just like as if they were running on the, the global zone, and that's really handy. And the advanced networking, um, which I'm gonna talk about in just a second, the crossbow stuff. So we had all these cool things, and then we said, hey, I know we can take this version of Circonus inside where we're running it on premise, and it normally requires a whole bunch of different machines, and you've gotta coordinate getting everything installed and running in the right order and everything. Why don't we also have an option to run everything on one machine. So this is, uh, it turns out that this fills a niche that um, it it's costs a whole lot less than the, uh, the normal full on private SaaS version. Um, it's easier to operate because everything uh, is basically taken away. All of the options are pretty much taken away and all you have to give us is an IP address and host and we will set up the entire distributed architecture inside one system. So it's SAS in a box. And this, this is really where we see the, the true expression of all of the value of Illumos. So all those things that I just mentioned are really cool in, in their own right, but then together they are actually more than the sum of their parts. So uh, this is sort of my attempt to kind of diagram out what we're doing here. Um, the host is the physical machine and then the dotted line is the global zone where you have an, an actual network interface that connects to the outside. 
Um, but we set up an ether stub, which I think we mentioned before, is just a virtual ethernet switch inside the machine, self-contained. Um, and then we, we established VNIX in the global zone and in all the non-global zones, so they can all talk to each other, but they don't actually, they're not actually exposed to the outside world. So everything flows through the global zone, and we have IP filter, which is also part of the Lumos gate, um, set up to NAT outbound traffic and also to forward inbound traffic. Um, into the zones. We terminate um, all of the services that we provide um, with a reverse proxy. It's uh, Apache traffic server running in the global zone that um, provides access to the web portal and the API and the, the streaming services that allow you to play graphs in real time. Um, all of that stuff is mapped and there's, a, uh, there's another sort of an orchestration script on top that uh, manages um, automates doing what you would normally do as an operator setting up a, a full install. So it knows how to take all that information and make, the, uh, make that JSON data bag configuration and it, it basically in about half an hour sets everything up. Um, and this is this has also turned out to be really valuable uh, as a sales tool when you're going into a prospect and they want to trial the inside product, they don't want to use the, the public status they want to try all the, the product, but, in, but instead of the really complex um, process of them acquiring enough machines and getting them all configured and put on the right network, they can just take a box and we can just spin this up and they can try out the product for, for a lot less effort. So, um, and again, all they need to provide us is just one IP address. And the other thing is that's cool about that is that you log on to the Global Zone and you can see every com every component of Circonus and you can detrace anything and it's all because it's all running on one system. Um, you you have this a, a kind of uh, a visibility into the whole system that you don't have even uh, when you're running the, the multi-system product. Yeah, I have a great yep. question actually. So. The full-blown multi-system on-site product is where each of those zones is like a real machine somewhere. Do I understand that correctly? Yeah. I yeah. Have a question: Can you migrate from the SaaS in the box slowly? No. Oh, okay. No, it's at, it's just too, it's too complicated to do that. So uh, because because that on that Ether stub is a uh, is an RFC 1918 network that's always the same. We should um, try. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'm sure that you can technically do it. Yeah. You can technically do it, but the, the point of this system is to be very simple and very low cost and oh, not right. require a whole lot of support. Okay. So, so yeah. you know, it's, it's um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you couldn't take component by component out and do that, but it's really easy to migrate from one install to another install. Okay. So you deploy the full version of it, and then you dump the metadata database, and then dump yep. the, the, the telemetry database. You, you just do it at sort of a higher level. <coughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry my, my, my next on, on machine, off machine network, or sorry. Yeah. Don't mind me, just, just thinking about weird new ways to exploit networking. All right. Yep, yep. And the, the VNIC stuff and the ether stub stuff is all part of, of Crossbow, and um, that stuff is, has been around for quite a while. Uh, before Open Solaris, I think even it was in uh, the SXCE stuff. Um, Stack Instances showed up in Solaris 10 update for Crossbow itself. Virtualized Nix did not show up until Open Solaris. Uh, okay, but I guess SXCE and Open Solaris were oh, at the yeah, same yeah. time. Yeah, they were just yeah, different yeah, expressions were, of the same yes. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I, I kind of rushed through that. I apologize. And, but we have more time for questions. Um, anybody have any questions about that? Gordon. Said we did have some um, operational concerns. There, you know, there's certainly, you know, like in any 
organization with more than one person who have differing opinions, and there is a camp that would love to see us just go jump on the IPS bad way. Yeah. So yeah. Some it's, questions it's we nice. weren't able to uh, answer. I'm curious whether you've dealt with this is uh, how you deal with uh, upgrades of uh, a couple of things. How, how you deal with uh, patch delivery and or upgrades on um, disconnected systems. Do you, do you try to do that? We don't have a need for that. We have customers that do that. Though. I mean, it's so because it's all it's all network based. So you can just stick an HTTP proxy in front of it. You, you, can, you can cache this stuff. You, you can you can mirror repos. You, you can do package receipt. Far be it for me to advocate for IPS, but <laughs> but with IPS you can give it I mean, a local repo. You can get a file. The, turn off the remote repos. It's take different on you guys, right? On you uses a local repo. It yeah. happens to also if you don't take the action to disconnect it from the rest. It happens to also go over the network quite like, well. My but if you give it a, a local repo that's complete, mm -hmm. let's say on an ISO, you can install it completely disconnected. So yeah, I guess I, I should have mentioned that. It's driving the uh, back of, uh, repo in a, in a file situation. But yeah. And I guess that handles uh, update, but does that, what about uh, delivering um, hot patch, for example, something we need to do operationally? Okay, like it's, still an update. Update. It's, it's still a package update. Yeah, you, it might you, can only a whole, you can only update a whole package. Yeah. There's no dim sum patching. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, that's not what I was asking for, but not, I, I wouldn't want to have to deliver an entire OS repository to do that. No, you, you, you can deliver, deliver just kernel so, kind of platform. Yeah, you can. Okay, okay so I, th I think I understand, I think I understand the motivation. So, what you can do, um, because uh, it, it, I, I wasn't clear about the HTTP thing, so you, it, there is the network component. But it also has this all of the same features supported for a local file-based repo, which is just a directory structure on disk somewhere, referred to at a file URL. Should describe um, what TWC is. So can you can you make so what one of the things we do in Debian is you know each of these packages you describe the manifest is just a dev file. So mm -hmm. if you just send somebody a dev file, they say dpackage, yep. dev I and yep. it works. So is there something equivalent to you? Yes, there is. So um, in, in instead of having to send an entire repo, you can send a single package as an archive. Mm -hmm. And effectively what an archive is, it's just an empty repo with one package in it, or, or some group of packages that's not the complete repo. And you can suck that, you can take that down and then suck it into a normal repo, or you can install from it directly. Um, but you'll have the same dependency constraints that the original package had. You're just publishing a new version of the package in a sort of a self-contained format um, that is like a little micro repo that you can copy around and, and do things with. If you want, I can next time next time I'm over for beer, I can show you how this works. We yeah. OmniOS Bloody build machine works on a file-based repo. We don't actually our release build machines use the HTTP one like the customers do, but the bloody one builds on disk and then when I push out to the bloody HTTP repo, I actually do it from that on disk repo. Mm -hmm. and, and Sometimes I'm, it breaks the course, but you know, it's bloody. That's the premise. I mean, we have a slightly different situation in that aside from this, the single node stuff, I mean, almost all the, the installations are the about 50 machines, right? So you're never trying to distribute a hot patch, you're just trying to distribute them 50 hot patches for their 50 machines. <laughs> so if they can't get to the network, they might be able to HTTP proxy to the network safely, but even if they can't do that, they can package receive the entire repo and control it internally. Um, and then they'll just get updates when they do package receive. So they'll get basically a file-based diff uh, well, manifest based dev. So that, actually, that was another question for us. So with dev stuff, you can just use it's static content. You can just drop it on any old HTTP server. You actually need to run back at depot to yep. do that, right? Yes. That's you, kind of, well, that's you do, or if, 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 if you want to use package archives, which are the, the, the little micro repo portable things, those you could actually just plop up on an HTTP Tec thing. Technically speaking, you don't need package depot. You only need it for searching. That's, yeah. that's, anyway, that's, that's been one of the stumbling yeah. blocks. A lot of people will say, no, I'm sorry, I'm not running that on our whatever, you know? Yeah. But, uh, next time I'm out for beer, uh, I should, we should go over that. The other, uh, I was just going to, probably nobody else cares about it, but we did have a guy write uh, a Python version uh, that uses the IPS libraries instead of inventing new, you know, Garrett, I think, mentioned a, a corn shell version of, of the sparsing and so forth. Mm -hmm. anyway, we, have, we have a reasonably nice version of the uh, IPS dev stuff that actually just reuses all the IPS internals now. Cool. I was 
we were, you know, I pulled the guy off before he got further. I asked him also if he looking in, to look into whether we could separate the runtime operational parts of IPS from the build time uh, parts of IPS. And that turns out to be quite hard because the way the stuff is architected, uh, those um, features are combined module by module in basically all of the uh, mm -hmm. modules. It's kind of divided the opposite direction. I would really like to see just a build, build time piece. Ideally, I'd like to not to, to depend on, on Python. Um, yeah. So if we have a nice, like a, a binary that we can use for building. Uh, I, I'd love for that whole shit. The whole, whole shit storm to not be in Python and be in C. Yeah. That'd be a great project. It, the, the, one of the nice things are the emotional <laughs> things. It doesn't really bother me that uh, you know we run Python during the build. I can live with that. You yeah. know, the fact that it's a different language makes it inconvenient to, for some of us to maintain. It also, but, it yeah. also brings your number of packages you're dependent on to do building up. The fact, the fact that I have to worry about Python being installed and being at a right version and being security patched correctly is just a waste of time because that's the only time I would ever ever see okay. Python. Well the nice the nice one of the nice things that I think makes that feasible is that that yeah. IPS operates with a client and a server and it's it's a version protocol. So you can implement the protocol in something else as long as it meets all the same features. Like there's no reason it has to be in Python. Well that, that yeah. protocol that's the reason I brought up package depot D. Right. The fact that package depot D customizes your content also that's one of the things that is I kind of wish they hadn't tried so hard to be so clever about downloading only exactly what you need because it, yeah. it's going to basically make it a lot harder for you to use a content distribution network or anything like that. Yeah. It, it would have been a lot it's easier. Actually, no, it's, it's, actually, it's actually much better to use a CDN. It's yeah. much more optimized. It's much faster than downloading the whole packages. Yeah. But how do you cache any of that? It's all cacheable. Yeah. All the assets are immutable. They're all hashes. Exactly. The only thing that you can't do magically is searching for things. The search indexes and the catalog. The catalog you can cache for short periods of time, but anytime you publish and you change that catalog. Right, so, that's, yeah, so that's what I'm wondering if we couldn't improve on that then. You know, what Debbie did, you know, they just said, you know, there's an operation to download the index. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the index is not that big, just download it over again, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, put, um, we put an Apache um, HTTPD reverse proxy in front of our depot servers to both to protect them because they don't have any authentication whatsoever, um, but also to do that that caching and kind of in some cases muck with the headers because some pack, PKG depot D is pretty conservative. It's it says like pragma no cache and all kinds of stuff must revalidate on everything, you know. And we kind of relaxed that for some of the things that we found that didn't really impact the client experience. Um, so like I said, we cache the catalogs for a minute or a couple of minutes just to make those repeated um, calls be a lot less expensive. You, you asked during your slide on constraints, what, what are other systems? Debian does actually let you write constraints pretty much however you want. I know that you can have, you, you can say require greater than or equal to and less than or equal to something or else, but, but having it as a, like a first class citizen kind of dependency is I thought in Debian when you required it, that it meant that it got installed. Yeah, that's, that's the other. The, that's the, the other problem. The corporations is you're setting constraints. And they don't. They they're don't optional. Right. Yeah. It doesn't have something equivalent to incorporate. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's the, the magic of that is that I mean that we have 200 packages, but on the whole. You don't of the need. You don't need all 200 of them on every system. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, you only need a very small subset of most of them. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? Thanks. I should say also that um, just a quick plug. Um, I have, I have some cards here. Um, Circonus offers uh, free home accounts, so if you want to just try out the, yeah, if you want to try out the product and, and see what it is that we do, what we're all about, um, you can try it out for free. Get a little, a few metrics to play around with, and try out the interface. So, yep. Thanks.